Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Love Go Everyone Health. My name is Dominic Lukes. I'm Product Marketing Manager here at Skills for Health and joining me is Andrew Lovegrove, Skills for Health Senior Consultant. How are things with you, Andrew? Okay. Hi, Dom. Well, great to be back and uh, great to be the other side of things. Um, I am now officially a statistic. Just under two weeks ago, I tested positive for COVID, um, managed to avoid it for two years, but it finally caught me. Thankfully, only had a couple of days of feeling a bit yucky and seem to be over it now. So great to be back here with you and uh, fighting fit. Yeah, it's well, obviously we've talked about this, well, in every, every episode we've uh, recorded, but seems like the, the numbers are spiking again, aren't they? Absolutely. Um, everyone in my family's had it, so... You're we, the last one uh, to fall. Uh, yep, yeah, absolutely. That's it now. Due to go on holiday in a few weeks' time, so in a kind of really perverse way, I'm kind of glad I've had it now, as opposed to having it in two weeks' time just before I'm about to go on holiday. So um, if ever there was a good time to have had it, the time I've had it was it. So um, I, I just be grateful for small mercies. And I'm just really pleased and I'm and, and very fortunate that um, I'm the other side of it and not got any uh, untoward symptoms and the same with the rest of my family. So I consider, you know, we've, we've come through this unscathed and we're actually very lucky. Yeah. So we thought we'd squeeze one more podcast in before the Easter break, and this is our fifth episode now. We seem to be getting a bit more comfortable behind the mic, and more importantly, the feedback we've been getting has been excellent as well. And this edition, we're going to go back to our sort of tried and tested format, whereby we'll look at the health sector news and some of the headlines that have caught our attention um, over the last week or so, and then we'll continue our discussion about widening participation uh, within the health sector. So first things first, and the news, um, I, I guess the, the, the top headline for me certainly was the the release of a sort of public survey into the NHS, which was um, recording, you know, the public's perception, satisfaction, confidence in the service. And I'm just wondering what, what, what your take was on, on the survey results, Andrew. Yeah, I saw the same news that you did, Dom, and I was quite saddened. It doesn't seem too long ago since we were all stood on our doorsteps at Thursday nights at eight o'clock applauding the NHS, and now our satisfaction levels seem to have plummeted. I'm sure somebody far cleverer than I would say there's a distinction between appreciation and satisfaction we appreciate the NHS, but we're just not very pleased with it at the moment. I think it's inevitable, uh, in a way, people's experience, and there's lots of examples out there where people's perception is the NHS is not performing as it should. Satisfaction levels are bound to be affected if that's the case. And it's that whole thing we've talked about before that whilst we've been in the grips of dealing with COVID for the last two years, everything else hasn't gone away. And that demand has just built up within the health sector. And so we're trying to play catch up on that. Plus, people who are getting ill now are kind of, you know, joining the queue with people who, frankly, shouldn't still be in the queue. And you look at some of the numbers you know, we've still got a significant number of people in hospital with COVID, and that's either because they're in hospital because of their COVID or they're in hospital with something else, but they are positive for COVID. You've almost, you know, you've got three types of people <laughs> in hospital at the moment, and that's causing all sorts of problems, both in terms of uh, capacity, throughput, clinical flow, and you know, the numbers of COVID are still high in the population and our workforce is our population. Our population is our workforce. So you've got high levels of sickness and absence, which is causing problems. It's impacting on the ability for services to actually deliver the clinical care that they need to. I guess it's kind of that perfect storm 
storm really that we're we're experiencing at the moment in health but we're also experiencing it in other sectors um I'm sure we've all seen the news recently of the queues at Manchester Airport, uh, flight cancellations at Heathrow. I myself the other day could be accused of hypocrisy. I'm there trying to book a train journey and suddenly the train I wanted to book isn't running at the moment and it's been cancelled because the train companies can't guarantee that they'll have sufficient staff to provide the level of service Now, in the grand scheme of things, made alternative arrangements and it was okay, but the health service is not immune to those to those kinds of issues. So you've like I say, it's that it's that perfect storm environment that we've got at the moment, Don. Yeah. I was just looking at the report, so I call this I think it was widely coverage, wasn't it? This this report. I saw it on the BBC, Sky News, it was in the independent paper as well, but there's there's a link to it on the Nuffield Trust website and some of the key headlines are overall satisfaction with the NHS fell to thirty six percent. That's an unprecedented seven percent decrease on twenty twenty. The main reason people gave for being dissatisfied was waiting times for GP and hospital appointments, followed by staff shortages. So you're absolutely right. It's, it, it feels like the NHS is going to take quite a while to recover from, from the pandemic, possibly more than any other sector and, and industry. Absolutely. In preparation for today, I was just having a quick scan through Twitter and somebody popped up in my timeline to say that tomorrow, a practice population of 12,000, um, they've got 1.5 whole time equivalent GPs in place tomorrow and they're saying we cannot provide the service we would wish to provide that people should expect to have provided with that level uh, of staff cover and people who may say well go out and bring bank agency locum staff in you go to such agencies and they'll say we haven't got anybody you know we're we're struggling to meet the requests for agency uh, staff ourselves so you know services that are depleted to such an extent are going to provide um suboptimal uh, experiences for people we'll prioritize and we'll try our best to see the people who are at most need or who are at most acutely ill and we'll try and respond to that but there's a whole load of unmet demand in the system and that's growing. That's not. That's not contracting. That's that's growing. And I'm sorry to say, I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. Well, yeah, you, know, you, you go on most news apps, and there seems to be a daily story in terms of trusts, ambulance services issuing sort of critical incidents, isn't there? And, you know, we could probably do a little roundup now. There's one story about the South Central Ambulance Service. There's others about trust just saying to call 999 in absolute emergencies, the waiting times, the, the increase in use of temporary structures outside A&E wards. It's all so gloomy. It is. Uh, I, I remember the other day a horrific story, and I would be so angry if it was a member of my own family. Uh, an elderly person had fallen out of bed during the night was discovered in the morning, I think either by a carer or a family member. They phoned an ambulance and they were told they could expect up to a 20-hour wait for an ambulance to come out. Now, that just, when you say that out loud, that just doesn't sound right. And I'm not here to defend the indefensible, but the ambulance service in question was probably dealing with so many people who were acutely unwell that people who'd fallen they were a lower grade of priority and that was the turnaround for them i was just going to say obviously later on in the podcast we're going to talk about widening participation obviously trying to increase the number of people that want to willingly work in the the health sector but that's not going to be a quick fix and you say the solution well the problem is going to get worse can you see any sort of short, immediate-term solutions to this current problems most, you know, hospitals and 
ambulance services are facing at the moment? Can you see any quick wins anywhere? So in terms of managing workforce shortages, a lot of the things that we talk about here at Skills for Health are solutions that are more long-term in nature, developing new roles, developing new ways of working. They are things that take time. They have lead times associated with them. I think one of the short-term solutions we have to think about is how we can stop people leaving at the rate that they're leaving at at the moment. How do we encourage people to stay and stay working in the health sector? And I think pay remuneration has got to be something that's factored in here. We're all aware of the, it's almost become a soundbite, but the cost of living crisis, probably this month is when that really, really will be noticed. The energy price hikes, the national insurance rise. I was in the supermarket the other day, and I don't know if it was because I hadn't been for two weeks because I was poorly, but you go around and you look at all the prices and you think, oh, that's gone up and it's not one or two pence things have gone up by well that's because you shop at waitrose <laughs> well you know even excluding the waitrose factored on um there's still um you know things do you know things are only going one way so i think remuneration reward strategy is something that's got to be considered in terms of making the people who are here want uh, to stay. For some people, you know, for lots of people, it's not just about the pay itself. You know, I could pay you a really good wage, but if you have a really bad experience at work, that isn't always going to be what keeps you in that work uh, setting. So thinking about employee health and well-being, employers asking themselves, you know, are we a good place to work you know would i want to come and work here what is it about us that sets us apart from from elsewhere so i think those are some of the probably more shorter term solutions but again those strategies take time effort and energy to to work on and i i don't know what capacity there is at the moment for employers to think like that because they're probably at the moment so focused on dealing with the urgent. How much time is there left to deal with the important stuff? Now, one of the stories that I came across in the last few days was about it was the Royal Preston Hospital. And you sort of touched about employee morale, but the, the sort of quotes in, in the news story about senior experienced staff crying with frustration and anger as they're having to resuscitate patients in the waiting room examining the viewing room, the CT changing room, seeing patients leave the departments being pulled out of the cubicle to allow someone more and more to be treated in their former space and patients die without the dignity of privacy. Like you said, it just, it must be an awful place to work in at the moment when it's so overstretched and the demand is unprecedented. You, you, you can't help but feel for the people that are working on, on the front line at the moment. So I'm going to reflect on my own experience. You know, I used to take pride for the organisations I worked at, Dom. You know, I, I'm i very proud that I trained to be a nurse in Liverpool, that I, my badge that says Liverpool School of Nursing in the shape of a liver bird, I'm very proud that I have that in my jewellery sort of box. And your sense of identity of working at a hospital or an organisation, lots of staff feel that. And when, you know, those stories enter the public consciousness, you know, I'm not a million miles away from the Royal Shrewsbury in Telford and the story uh, from the uh, the Oakenden report into maternity uh, care. Rightly, the emphasis is on those people who who were a victim to that poor care, but what's that done for the for the staff who work at that organisation that they are associated with with that story that they somehow are tainted by that story? What's that done to morale? What's that done to uh, staff satisfaction? What's that doing to you know patient care? Well, when these stories break. We very often talk about them, uh, 
guess it's just very typical of the news cycle, but we focus on the story from one angle and then the news cycle moves on and we stop talking about it. But what what's it left in its wake? You, you know, I I remember, again, not too far away from the Mid-Staffs Hospital, uh, and I'm sure people will remember the the scandal from from there many years ago that had a huge effect on i suppose the the the, the psyche of, of of people working in that in the health sector in that in that part of the world I, I, in fact what i remember most was being sat on a train going from london to crew once and the train stopped at stafford and somebody sat behind me on the train looked out the window and said oh stafford that's where all those patients died wasn't it and you you know people did die at mid staffs but that doesn't you know typify that's more than what you know the good care that does take place in that part of the world but the impact of 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 of, of some of these stories i'm not trying to excuse poor care dom and i'm not trying to say we shouldn't uh, shine a light on bad practice but we need to think about when we do that 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 can have wide-reaching consequences and an impact on the workforce who to be fair are probably on their knees to start with yeah but I, you know i couldn't, couldn't agree more and i suppose you know trying to turn this slightly politically i at least you can say the government's realised there is a problem. They're trying to fill some of the funding gap. They've stood by their guns with the national insurance increase. Hopefully it has some sort of impact, but like you said, this is more sort of medium long term, isn't it? Yeah, and without wishing to be glass half empty, money, you cannot just buy your way out of some of these problems Having the money is great. I'm not going to say we shouldn't have more money, but we need to think about how we spend it and that we spend it wisely. Yeah. Um, I can remember, in fact, I can remember where I was exactly the first time I read the NHS plan in 2000, which was, a, for those of you who can remember, was the, um, the, the, the first sort of major policy initiative of of the Labour government of Tony Blair, which promised and did deliver record levels of funding. And when I saw the plan, I thought, yes, someone's actually going to save the NHS because I trained as a nurse in the mid-90s and, you know, was not a pretty place to be back then. So we got the funding, but we perhaps didn't always think about where it was spent as wisely as we should have done. And I just hope we don't make that mistake again. My fear, as the organisations within the NHS are reorganised, that we don't spend too much time focusing on structural reform. And in the, as a consequence of that, we lose sight of what's really important here, that everything we do should be about improving and enhancing patient outcomes my experience of NHS reorganisation is we tend to take our eye off the prize a bit because we get so focused on reorganising the deck chairs. I hope this time I'm proved wrong, but I've got 25 years of experience behind me that says, ooh, not so sure here, but we'll see. We'll see. Okay. I think it turned out to be quite a general overview in terms of you know, the sort of problems and issues and some of the stories that are making the headlines at the moment. So I guess what we'll do now is perhaps go, well, it feels like an actual natural lead through actually, doesn't it? So last edition, we talked about widening participation in the NHS, mm -hmm. look at perhaps some of the key obstacles in, in attracting a health sector workforce, obviously staff shortages, it's been a kind of golden thread to many of the sort of stories and themes we've already talked about already. So obviously there's been many programmes and initiatives and campaigns to attract and retain new recruits and talent to, to the NHS. You know, my, my question is, has that had any impact? And probably the answer is going to be no. Do you think 
what those underlying reasons might be. So I think the initiatives that we've had have been in of themselves have been have been good initiatives. They've been well meaning, they've had a purpose and you know in of themselves are to be applauded. I think for me the problem with initiatives is that they always feel as though they're sort of on the periphery. They're sort of, I've got my day job and then I need to think about these things. And again, we perhaps think about widening participation in a almost in a project way of thinking. You know, we have, we're going to have an initiative where we'll need a project to support its delivery. And I say this as a member of a team who's commissioned by organisations many, many times to deliver on projects. And projects can be great for getting stuff done, but projects are temporary states. They are temporary environment. Projects close out. All projects close out. If they don't, then there's something gone very wrong there. But all projects come to a close. And it's what you're left with at the end of it that's important. And something I've noted over the years is we put so much effort into the project itself that when it comes to transferring it into sort of business as usual activity, everyone's worn out. You know, it, it it's lost its it's lost its edge somehow. You know, everyone's fatigued by what it is we've tried to do in the project. So I think with the limitations of initiatives around widening participation is that they've been initiatives and they've perhaps not been integrated into what I would call mainstream business planning as much uh, as they should have done. So one of the other issues that that, that we have, um, as you know, Dom, I'm somebody who cares very much about workforce planning and that we we we, we plan our future workforce needs how much or to what extent has workforce planning and widening participation been seen as one and the same thing? Or are they seen in splendid isolation? The reality is it will be mixed in different environments and different organisations. I would argue you can't have one without the other because one of the uh, measures of success of widening participation is that you're addressing your workforce supply problems, challenges that you see by trying to create a more diverse, representative workforce. That is a great thing in of itself, but also it's a vehicle for recruitment, for filling vacancies, planning as people retire, move on, looking at your turnover rates, that uh, by having a more inclusive workforce, we are likely to improve our levels of workforce sustainability because we will have people who are ready to step into posts or we create different ways of working new roles when those opportunities arise. So for me, you can't have one without the other but I'm aware, I won't name the organisation that I did some work uh, with, but their workforce planning function lived within the business environment. Their kind of widening participation, EDI, sat in a bubble within the HR department and they just didn't speak. Well, individuals spoke, but in terms of the maturity of their relationships, they didn't see the value that each other had and what they could do for each other by working together more collaboratively. And that was a great shame. Obviously, we've, t- we've talked about what must be quite a challenging work environment for, for many NHS um, employees at the moment. Probably a very difficult question to, to ask, but how do you think the health sector could better market itself as a rewarding place to work and, and to develop a career? I think for me, a couple of things. First of all, we have to be honest. We have to say, you know, working in, working in health 
is hard work. You know, it's it, there's, there's no getting away from that. It is hard work and you have to be honest and upfront. Going slightly off tangent, I was a big fan of the film Private Benjamin with Goldie Horn. I used to love that film, particularly when I was a teenager. And there's a scene where she goes to the army recruitment office and she's shown this brochure of ships and yachts and she's told, oh, join the army, it will be this lavish lifestyle and then she turns up at her basic training camp and kind of like the reality hits and um there's some very funny scenes between her and the training sergeant the late great Eileen Brennan and you know she'd been oversold she'd been sold this it's x and actually it's y so I think we have to be honest and and say what working in the health sector is like but we have to promote you know i i I have memories don of times where i know i've made a difference in people's lives some of those differences were quite short short acting short-lived others that will have lived on and are probably still living on now and there are very few very few other industries and other other sectors where where you can have that experience. And I think that's something that I think we need to sell. I'm kind of giving the, the quotation signs with my hands here, but we need to be able to sell. There is nothing, there's nothing quite like look, looking after people and making a difference in other people's lives. And, that, and that's something I would, you know, if I was there as the face of the recruitment campaign, that would be one of my key messages. Going back to what we said in our previous podcast, the breadth of roles that we have within health. So you you can be an accountant and still make a difference in patient care. You know, great. You know, you can be a lawyer and make a difference in, in, in people's lives. You can, you know, there's the breadth of opportunity is is amazing. You know, we need good communication people. We need marketing people. We we need people who can help us design the campaigns, who can promote those campaigns. You know, they are, they are needed. But for me, we need to keep them focused in reality, but showing the positive sides of that reality because there's there's nothing quite quite like it. And I think I've said this before that. It's been a long time since I've stood by the bedside and looked after a patient directly. But what I do here, the work that I do, I've always got that that scenario in my mind. And that's why I care about the work I do now, because I believe in doing the work that I do. I'm ultimately making it better for somebody else to help them to look after someone uh, uh, better. And that's and, that, and that's a powerful motivator. You kind of covered this already a little bit, but do you think the sector is inclusive enough? And, and by that, do people get a chance to sort of test the health sector as a career opportunity without having to sort of commit to quite lengthy periods of study and investment? Do you think the they could be more responsive and more opening to try health as a career. You, you know, you might be a, you might be a career mover, or you know, joining the industry quite late. It, it's interesting. You have to make a lot of decisions about your career in health very early on in your your career. One of the things I've always been very very keen to explore, and I can almost hear people now in my own head saying why this couldn't be done, that the first year of any pre-registration training, so for a nurse, a physio, an OT, a speech and language therapist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, your first year should be the same and you should all be on the same programme and you should all be in mixed cohorts because i think a a lot of what 
you are taught in that first year is very similar, not identical, but very similar. You're taught the fundamentals of care, you're taught around communications, you're taught the theoretical underpinning of being a professional. We all cover anatomy and physiology. There's, the, there's an awful lot of similarity. And I wonder at the end of the first year, if then you decide which profession is most appealing to you. So I trained to be uh, a nurse because going back to something we said in a previous podcast, that was one of the main career options. But had I known then what I know now, I might have wanted to combine two of my other interests in life. So at the time, Dom, as a teenager, I was a reasonably good pianist and used to play in a jazz group. I didn't want to become a professional musician uh, as a career, but I am a great believer in music as a therapy and it has its own branch within occupational therapy. And I actually think I may have trained to be an occupational therapist, but with a special interest in music. But at 18, 19, I didn't know what occupational therapy really was. I'd heard of it and few disparaging comments from ill-informed people probably affected some of my decision making. But, you know, that's somebody who was committed and desired to work, you know, in the health sector. So somebody who was not, you know, not 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 even in that place wasn't aware of, of, of the options that they got, you know, potentially had. So uh, I think there's there are things we can do to make our training more inclusive. I know I can, like I say, I can hear, I can feel the daggers already saying absolutely not, you couldn't do that. But I've I've always felt, let's give it a go and see what happens. Yeah, I suppose apprenticeships have got a role to play here as well, Andrew. They have, they have. When used well, they can be a great vehicle for widening participation, for encouraging people to come and work in the health sector. I was very fortunate. I'm going to give a shout out to our health heroes now, Dom, uh, which was a couple of weeks ago. Wasn't there in person, but saw it online and were, you know, kudos to everybody who helped facilitate that. It was a really good uh, event. But I think it was how quickly the years blurred into one, Dom. I'm going to say about three or four years ago now, we had a previous award uh, and I was very lucky to go and interview somebody who'd been awarded apprenticeship, apprentice, sorry, apprentice of the year. And it was somebody who was training to be a mental health nurse and was actually working in a secure psychiatric unit. And it was so interesting listening to this individual story, somebody who who's, you know, that experience in mainstream education hadn't been great, kind of to left school with perhaps not the qualifications that they, they should have done, fell into a career in retail, but realised that that perhaps wasn't where they wanted to, to end up, but had learned some really useful, great thing about retail is you learn how to talk to people and deal with the public, two great skills for working in the health sector, came to work for um, the local mental health trust and because apprenticeship funding was available was able to go on to train to be a nurse because I remember him saying he couldn't afford he was where he was in his life cycle to suddenly go from you know he wasn't living at home with parents or was able to move into kind of like student accommodation there's no way he could have afforded to give up you know he needed a paid salary and an apprenticeship enabled him to, to do that. I often uh, wonder where he is now because his story was quite inspiring, hence why he won the award. And it was it, it was great to go and interview him. So where apprenticeships work well, they work really well. But again, the risk of them that they are seen as an initiative and when they're not planned for well, where they know they're not factored into the workforce plan, then they can be quite destructive, demoralising, demotivating. 
So I, I guess the soundbite for me is all these initiatives work if we plan for them and we utilise them properly. Yeah, not in isolation. Sort of to sort of wrap up our sort of participation focus and also to wrap up this edition of the podcast. Our final question to you is what one piece of advice do you have for anyone thinking about entering a career in the health sector? Wow, that that's um, a broad question that I want to give a very specific answer to. I'm going to answer that by giving you my own my own answer. You know, when when, when I was a 17, 18 year old and looking at myself in the mirror, do I think I can do it? Do I want to do it? Am I willing to put the effort in to make it happen? And I answered all those three questions with a yes. So I think that's what, as an as an individual, those would be my tips. Those those would be the three questions I would ask of myself. What I would say to the sector more generally is: Are we enabling? Do we have the right enablers in place that when people ask those questions of themselves and they say yes, we can rise to that challenge and create the environment in which they can succeed and flourish? If one of those two are out of kilter, then we've got a problem. When they're both out of kilter, we've really got a problem. But I don't know if that answers a question or not, Dom, but that's... Uh, hand on heart that's what I think no that was brilliant fantastic so all that's left for me to say is thank you very much for listening to this latest edition of Love Grove on Health a reminder that our podcast can be found on all the major platforms including Spotify Amazon Apple and Google and that's where you can also subscribe so you never miss an episode You can also find the recordings on our Skills for Health website and social channels. Until next time, many thanks. Bye.